Hey guys, Andrarchy here, coming at you with something a bit different today. I was inspired by the post by Garant, uh, the makeup tutorial post. So I figured, well, why don't I show you guys how to do a good Muay Thai roundhouse kick. This video should contain everything you need to know to throw a right roundhouse kick. Now, I'm not saying I throw a perfect one, but it's actually a really simple kick. It's really efficient. That's part of the beauty of it. So uh, it should contain all of the concepts and all the knowledge you need. And then you have to go into the gym and practice and ingrain that information into your muscle memory. But if you practice regularly and come back to this video and be critical of your own technique, look at these principles, you should be good. All right. Okay, what I'm doing here is demonstrating what I call phase one of the kick. Phase one is essentially how you would punt a soccer ball or football. In phase two, we will rotate our shoulders to get the kick moving horizontally, but all of the power in the kick comes from this motion, phase one. And in order to understand why that is, we need to understand the physics of the kick. The Muay Thai kick, more than any other, capitalizes on a compliance with the laws of physics and biomechanics. It treats the kicking leg, in this case the right leg, as a lever. A lever is a beam connected to ground by a hinge or pivot called a fulcrum. The ideal lever does not dissipate or store energy, which means there is no friction in the hinge or bending in the beam. The beam is the leg. Therefore, we want it to be as rigid as possible because any bend will dissipate energy. Part of the reason why phase one is an entirely vertical motion is because in order to move the leg horizontally out to the side of the body, the hip flexor muscles need to be activated. This introduces friction into the hinge or fulcrum, which is the hip. We want the ball of our hip moving fluidly within the hip socket to remove as much friction from the fulcrum as possible. In addition, moving your leg out to the side, away from your opponent, merely increases the distance the leg has to travel, giving your opponent more time to see the strike coming. Another physical law that Muay Thai complies with is that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. This is why, in a properly thrown Muay Thai kick, the shin should travel from your fight stance in a straight line toward the target. At least it should be as straight a line as possible to maximize the speed of the kick by shortening the distance. When practicing your kicks, try exaggerating the rigidity of your kicking leg. Throw a kick with the leg absurdly rigid, straight as a rail. When the kick makes contact, it should feel like all the energy being created by your body is being concentrated in the point on your shin that is making contact with the bag. And the reason it feels like that is because you have effectively turned your leg into a lever and the majority of the force you are creating is being channeled into the target. Now I know I said exaggerate the rigidity in your leg, but the truth is that this is actually how rigid you want your leg to be so as to maximize the effect of leverage. This brings up the matter of what part of the leg we strike with. In Muay Thai, we strike with the bottom of our shin because it is a dense bone as opposed to using the foot, which is filled with tiny bones, ligaments, and tendons that are easily damaged. Now you might be thinking, well, if I don't bend my leg, how do I kick? This is what makes the hips so important. This is why the hips have to lead the motion. How your hip moves will determine entirely how your leg moves. Here I am only doing the vertical motion, so the hip thrusts up before the leg follows suit. Later on in the kick, when we add the horizontal motion, you will see that the hip has to lead the way there as well. Some might say that you should also be going up on the toes of your pivot leg. However, in my opinion, going up on the toes of your pivot foot should happen naturally when you kick properly. The forward and upward motion of the leg should propel you onto your toes. And so this shouldn't actually have to be something you do intentionally once you have proper technique. The next two important aspects of the kick that we are seeing in action here 
are how I'm leaning and what my arms are doing. My coach, Brandon Levi, out of Evolution Muay Thai in New York City, is of the opinion that it doesn't really matter what you do with your arms during the kick. Part of this is precisely because we lean back. A proper kick places your head out of striking distance and so eliminates the need to use your hands to protect your face. That's why what you do with your hands should largely depend on what feels comfortable for you and what enables you to perform all the other components of the kick. Typically, this means moving the arm on the kicking side counter to the kick. So as the right leg is kicking up, the right arm should be moving down. It's basically the same motion you use when running, presumably because it has efficient biomechanics. This motion also helps during phase two of the kick when we start moving the leg horizontally in addition to vertically. The lean, however, serves another function as well. Once again, it removes friction from the fulcrum. If you don't lean back, the ligaments and tendons in your hip, as well as the muscles in your leg, like the hamstring, start reaching the outer bounds of their elasticity. This introduces friction into the fulcrum, the hips, which dissipates force from the kick. This can actually be a detriment to people who are extremely flexible when they are learning to kick. Because they are more flexible, they can get their kick higher without leaning back, which is a great way to get punched or kicked in the face. Now we're ready to move on to phase two. Our upper body is leaning back, the leg is rigid, and we are on the balls of our pivot foot, in this case, the left foot. The left leg should also become rigid, though it can't start in that position because the fight stance requires the leg to be bent so that kicks can be checked, you can slip and duck punches, and of course, move back and forth and side to side within the ring. Because the kicking leg trails behind, it can remain rigid. The first step in phase two is to incorporate a lean to the left. So not only are you leaning back, but you are also leaning in the direction that the kick is heading. This way you are generating even more power in the kick by adding the momentum of your body. However, this only works if your body is moving toward the target. If you lean the other way or too far back, you will be taking power away from the kick. This also highlights that there are no hard lines between phase one and two. The distinction I am making is intended to help you break down the components of a very complex motion. But in reality, every movement comes together holistically. Leaning toward the target is also important because it enables you to keep your kicking leg rigid and your kicking motion purely vertical while guaranteeing that your right foot won't make contact with the ground. The most important element of phase two, however, is all about the shoulders. Obviously, we need to apply some horizontal motion to the kick Otherwise, we won't be able to hit the target. Now, it's important to point out that we don't need much. Too many people hook their kicks so that the shin makes contact with the body at a 90 degree angle. Put another way, the leg is moving parallel to the ground when it makes contact. There are several problems with this. First, by looping the kick, you are forcing the leg to travel more distance because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. This means the kick takes more time to reach its target, which gives your opponent more time to defend themselves. But more importantly, all of the momentum of the kick is traveling vertically. The more you redirect the kick horizontally, the more you reduce this vertical momentum and consequently the power of the kick. The kick should make contact with the target at something closer to a 45 degree angle. Before going on to more technique, I'd like to set some time aside to talk about the target of the kick. Most people tend to kick too high in practice. They tend to aim essentially for the upper arm. But there are really only three targets for the kick. The upper leg, the portion of your body between the hip and the elbow, and the head. The head is an extremely low probability target, so the vast majority of kicks should be targeted at the body and the legs. Since we're talking about the regular right kick, which has mechanics significantly different from the leg kick, I will focus mainly on the body. Obviously, the hip is a very dense bone, so kicking the hip isn't going to do much damage and may even hurt yourself. 
The upper half of the torso is also protected by the ribs and the arms when your opponent is in a proper fight stance. So that really only leaves about three inches of a target. This is where we are trying to slip our kick into. The added benefit of this position is that it enables us to maximize the body mechanics and physics that I talked about earlier. This is why the body kick is also the most powerful kick. So when you're practicing your kicks, make sure you are making contact with the bag just below your own ribs and try to be as consistent and precise as possible because the target is so small. Also, don't forget that your opponent will be crouched in their fight stance, so your kick doesn't have to go as high as it would if they were standing straight up. For this reason, the kick doesn't have to go very high at all. Let's get back to the technique, specifically what you're going to be doing with your shoulders. Rotating your shoulders 180 degrees enables you to apply additional torque to the fulcrum, the hip, and actually add power to the kick while creating horizontal motion and without activating any of the muscles in the hip. In other words, the ball of the hip should still be floating freely within the socket. The hip should be leading the kick up until the moment of contact. Think about a baseball player swinging a bat. The handle of the bat moves through space first, guiding the bat along its trajectory until the bat makes contact with the ball, at which point the handle and the end of the bat are exactly perpendicular to the desired trajectory of the ball. In the same way, the hip and the point of contact of the shin should be perpendicular to the desired trajectory of the force of the kick, which is straight through the middle of the target. Our goal is for the force of our kick to penetrate as deeply into the core of our opponent as is possible, thereby inflicting the most amount of damage. If executed properly, at the moment of contact, your body should resemble an upside-down Y shape, where your torso is the leg of the Y and your legs are the arms. In this position, you have minimized the friction in your hips by not activating the hip flexors or significantly stretching the ligaments, tendons, and muscles in your legs and hips. The last phase of the kick, phase three, is the least important and complex, but people still often struggle with it. In this phase, the kicking leg is returned to the fight stance. The way this is accomplished is essentially by reversing the motion of the kick. The shoulder should be rotated back 180 degrees, which when combined with the equal and opposite force generated when the kick impacts the target is sufficient to enable your leg to follow its original trajectory back to its point of origin. But remember, the straighter the line that your leg follows from the point of contact back to your fight stance, the faster you will be back in position and ready to either protect yourself or throw another strike. And that's basically it. I know it probably sounds a bit overwhelming and complex, which is why I recommend thinking about only one element at a time when you are practicing your kicks. People often try to think about too much while they're throwing a kick and wind up getting flustered. Trainers often make this same mistake, giving students far too many recommendations all at the same time. We can only focus on one element at a time. You can only cease thinking about an element once it becomes ingrained in your muscle memory. So focus on one thing at a time and practice it until it either becomes ingrained or you get bored of it. So for example, you might start by simply doing phase one, the punt. Focus on the lean and making sure that by the end of the kick you are on the toes of your pivot foot. Once you've nailed down phase one, you can go on to phase two. I would also recommend periodically practicing phase one, even if you feel like you are progressing. Every component of the kick is critical, and it takes years to master each one. Never make the mistake of thinking any element of your kick is perfect. I'd like to end this tutorial with my two favorite recommendations for mastering your kick technique. The first is the spin around kick. This is my favorite way for beginners to acquire proper technique because it requires very little conscious thought at all, and you can practice it anywhere there is enough space. You're going to feel silly at first, but that's a small price to pay for proper technique. The way you perform the spin around kick is simply by kicking without a bag and then allowing the kick to continue forcing your body to spin a full 360 degrees until you are back in your fight stance. 
All you have to do is focus on one goal. Use the kick to spin around. You won't be able to do this on the first try, but if you keep trying, you will naturally gravitate toward great technique without even having to think about any specific elements. Of course, if you try to apply the information provided in this tutorial, you will be able to master this exercise more rapidly. The second exercise I recommend to beginners is throwing slow and controlled kicks at the bag and stopping your leg on the target, holding it there for a moment, and then pushing off the target to return to your fight stance. If you cannot do this, you are not applying proper technique. I have seen many people attempt this exercise and then give up, claiming they are simply not flexible enough or not strong enough to do this. This is incorrect. This requires zero flexibility or strength. The reason they can't do it is because they are attempting to use tiny muscles, mainly the hip flexors, to support the entire weight of their leg. All right, in my opinion, this tutorial has everything you need to know to throw a great Muay Thai right kick. This kick is not only extremely powerful, but it is also very good for self-defense. It's hard to see coming and anyone not trained in Muay Thai or mixed martial arts simply won't even know how to defend against it. In addition, since it's directed at the body, it will immobilize your opponent while greatly diminishing the risk of the long-term damage that can come with striking someone in the head. But the power of this kick must be respected. It should only be performed in a controlled setting with skilled opponents or in self-defense. Anything else would be extremely irresponsible. Thanks for watching. See you soon.